So good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our event, Discerning Our Vote in Politically Charged Times. My name is Sarah Rudolph, and I'm a Loretto sister and a social justice animator at the Mary Ward Centre in Toronto. I would like to begin our time together by acknowledging the land upon which we are gathering. And I would invite you to write your name in the chat and to tell us where you are joining from and include the Indigenous territory if you know it. So let us take a moment to acknowledge and honour the power of the sun, wind and the rain that nurtures life on earth. The spirit of the fields, the forests and mountains, the oceans and rivers, and all that lives within. The wisdom of our ancestors, the indigenous peoples, and the original inhabitants of the land we are on. We acknowledge especially and give thanks to the original peoples on whose homelands we stand today and in Toronto, that is the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Anishinaabeg First Nations, and more recently occupied by the Mississaugas of the Credit, and now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and gather on these territories. We affirm our desire for right relations with all Indigenous peoples built on respect and reciprocity, and we commit to redress the harms of colonization. So today, December 10th, we observe Human Rights Day, which commemorates the United Nations adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. The declaration sets out a broad range of fundamental rights and freedoms to which all of us are entitled, including the right to take part in the government of our country directly or through freely chosen representatives. As we prepare to participate in the upcoming Canadian election, we remind ourselves of this right, as well as the responsibility we have towards the common good and collective well-being. I would like to acknowledge that this event is a collaborative effort of many organizations. Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Toronto, Catholic Conscience, Centre Oblat, Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice, the Mary Ward Centre, the Office of Religious Congregations for Integral Ecology, Regis College, and the Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto. We are pleased to offer this contemplative space for political reflection and conversation. And I would now like to turn it over to Father Trevor Scott, the director of the Jesuit Forum, to introduce our main speaker. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. It's so good to see all of you. Um, uh, have an interest in uh, this important topic of uh, political dialogue <clears throat> in a, in a, within a prayerful context, a discerning context. Uh, and this is one of the um, significant motivations of, of having such a gatherings uh, as this, discerning our vote in uh, politically charged times uh, around a, a document, a discerning document that the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States um, put out a few years ago, entitled Contemplation and Political Action, an Ignatian Guide to Civic Engagement. Um, we feel that um, having a conversation, a shared conversation, um, a prayerful conversation on how it is that we are politically engaged in uh, highly polarized times uh, is important. Um, how we can reflect upon our political engagement beyond the headlines that is informed by our faith uh, in a prayerful way. Um, and we hope that this is part of a wider series. Um, but I'd like to introduce um, Father Ted Penton, who's a Canadian Jesuit, who was, um, he'll, he'll talk uh, more about it, but um, he was, um, the facilitator of the creation uh, of this document, Contemplation and Political Action, that we have been reflecting upon. When he was the Secretary of the Office of Justice and Ecology 
for the Canada U.S. Jesuit Conference. Uh, he's no longer in that role uh, at this time. Uh, he's now the current secretary to the provincial of the Canadian Jesuit Pro uh, province. Uh, but during his time as secretary of the Office for Justice and Ecology, uh, he was instrumental in the creation of this document. Just a few words about uh, Father Ted uh, before we ask him to kind of uh, break open um, the inspiration for this document and why the conference felt it was important for such a document to be created. Uh, Father Ted was born and raised in Ottawa, and he first met the Jesuits through the Jesuit Volunteer uh, Corps uh, in the United States. And from 2000 to 2002, he worked for the Farm Worker Unit of Legal Aid of North Carolina as part of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, leading outreach to migrant workers across North Carolina to educate them about their rights. And so inspired by this work to study and practice law, he returned to Canada for, to work for the Department of Justice in Ottawa for a brief time. And then he entered the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, in 2009. He was ordained uh, a priest in 2019 in Toronto. And then in his years as a Jesuit, he has worked for the Ignatian Spirituality Project, which is a network of volunteers offering retreats Ignatian-based retreats for men and women experiencing homelessness and, and recovery from addictions. And as I mentioned, he also was with the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States as the Secretary of Justice and Ecology uh, in Washington, D.C. And um, over this past year, Father Ted has served the Jesuits of Canada as Secretary to the Provincial so we're very grateful to have Ted with us. Just give us a bit of background on the reason for such an important document as 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 contemplation and political action is. So, um, Ted, welcome. And Great. Thanks so much, uh, Trevor and, and uh, Sarah, and thanks for all uh, of you who were uh, instrumental in organizing the gathering uh, this evening. Um, so as uh, Trevor said, uh, this time I was working down in, in D.C. So I moved there in 2018 uh, to work for the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States uh, with, in the Office of Justice and Ecology, which had two primary roles. One is advocacy with the U.S. federal government on justice and ecology issues. Uh, and the second is uh, networking, uh, kind of across the various uh, ministries, Jesuit ministries in the U.S. and Canada, also globally, that work on, on uh, justice uh, issues. Um, so in 2019, uh, the 2020 uh, election was starting to, to loom uh, large. And uh, kind of one of the, the big questions for us, for our office, was what's the best way for us as the Society of Jesus to engage uh, in the in the election, uh, in preparation uh, for such an important uh, uh, time. Um, so part of the the context that we're working in uh, there, the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, each election year, they put out an extensive uh, voting guide, which is called Faithful Citizenship. Uh, and this it's a it's a fairly lengthy guide. It goes through, among other things, each of the major uh, kind of political issues uh, and summarizes the Catholic uh, teaching on those issues. It also provides uh, kind of the, the positions that the bishops may have taken on them. Um, I certainly wouldn't say it's a perfect guide, but it's, it's pretty good. You know, it gives a good uh, kind of primer uh, on the lay of the land uh, on this sort of range of issues. Uh, so for us, kind of one starting point was that we weren't interested in kind of putting out some alternative or competing document, um, nor, frankly, do we have the capacity to do something with that kind of scale uh, and breadth. So in, in considering a bit what approach we might take, um, one thing we were reflecting on is, is that, you know, the, the challenge for any voter that takes Catholic social teaching seriously uh, is that in the United States, as in Canada, as in most uh, countries, the, there's no single party or politician that, that kind of follows or represents well all of the churches 
uh, teachings. Uh, as we all know, you know, for example, there, there are some more left-wing parties that tend to be closer to the church teaching on issues like economic justice or care for our common home. Uh, there, there tend to be uh, more right-wing parties that are uh, generally closer to the church's teachings on the sanctity of human life, on marriage and family, and on religious freedom. Uh, and so this, it, it kind of leaves each individual Catholic with the responsibility, it would say, of kind of weighing uh, how in any given election year uh, the various parties or candidates for office may best respond to what we see as the most important issues uh, kind of facing our, our country. Uh, and faithful Catholics uh, can and uh, do analyze these issues differently. They prioritize the various issues differently, and, and they, they vote for different parties and uh, different uh, candidates. Uh, this challenge, though, uh, as a, a kind of faithful Catholic voter, is, is also really an opportunity uh, in that in what you know we widely recognize as a very polarized political setting, Catholics are, are really well situated to, to kind of cut through that polarization uh, precisely because we don't fit well into one camp or the other. We have a basis for kind of speaking with those who may find themselves on very different sides of the aisle uh, politically. Uh, and so in terms of our own reflection, we, we thought that, that rather than kind of going through issues one at a time, we thought it, it might be more useful to, to take a step back and, and look at some more fundamental questions, uh, namely kind of why and, and how we as Catholics engage in political life. Uh, so the why part came fairly easily, and I would expect for anybody who would sign up for this type of event, it wouldn't need a lot of convincing on whether or not uh, we should engage politically. Um, that said, I can understand, you know, some people are really put off by the ugliness of much of our politics and, and may want to just avoid it uh, completely, uh, tune it out in, in disgust, and and I would have some, some sympathy there. Um, but uh, on, on the other hand, you know, we do have a responsibility uh, to do what we can to serve the common good, uh, and, and especially in a democratic society, right? This is a responsibility that, that we have not just to take care of our own interests, but for our brothers and sisters, uh, especially those who are suffering, especially those who are poor. Uh, and this is really at the heart of, of our Christian gospel. Uh, and engaging in the political process is one of the primary ways that we can do this, right? That we can offer assistance to others, that we can set up social structures that treat people with justice, with dignity. Uh, and so at the end of the day, I would, would see, and I think our Catholic tradition would see, that, that, that disengaging entirely from the political process is, is really a form of of abdication of that, that responsibility. The question, though, of how to engage in political life, I think that brings out some more interesting kind of possibilities to, to consider. And in this document, in the preparation of this document, uh, I, I see that the, what we've kind of proposed is, is really centered around encounter different forms of encounter. Pope Francis, of course, speaks often of a culture of encounter. Uh, and I would look here, and I see kind of reflected in this document, different forms of encounter. That, that first and, and, and primary one is our encounter with God, right? Our own, our own prayer, our own worship. Uh, and as uh, Catholics, as people working in the Ignatian tradition, our political engagement, we believe, should really be grounded in our prayer, grounded in an openness to a God who is always greater, always larger than I can imagine, a God who always has surprises in store. Um, we spent a lot more attention on 
uh, encounter with other other people, right? Encounter with others, uh, and the w- one category that I, I would privilege here, and I think that comes out really, really uh, uh, centrally in in the document, is encounter with people that we don't agree with. Uh, and here, you know, especially in in this kind of polarized time, uh, in a media environment where where people go to such disparate sources on the internet, on social media, uh, to get their news, to hear political opinions, there's this omnipresent risk of only hearing and, and reading uh, those who, who already agree with us and not being exposed very much to different views, to different political views, or uh, only to being exposed to those in their most extreme forms in, 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 in times that they're being attacked or, or mocked. Uh, as absurd, uh, rather than uh, as views that that we can really learn from. Um, so, in in kind of looking back at the the document, uh, for me, the the sort of the central of the the several points in the document, kind of the central one is is the seventh point, uh, which is the the importance of detachment from our own political views. Uh, detachment, uh, for those who are familiar with the Ignatian tradition, uh, is, is an important uh, kind of spiritual discipline, uh, right? To be freed from from those things that the the, the the attachments that make us less free, less free to kind of follow God's will, less free to see God the way that God is is present to, in our world. Uh, and the an important question raised here is, and and a question that it's proposed that that we ask of ourselves, is to what extent do my political choices kind of flow from my own attachment to the gospel, from a moral framework rooted in the gospel, versus to what extent do do my own political attachments and political relationships uh, determine my moral framework? That is, like, am I engaging in politics through the lens of the gospel? Or to what extent do my own politics, do my own political partners uh, become the lens through which I read the gospel? Uh, to give some examples here, you know, do, does the, the framework that I adopt possibly lead me to undervalue the protection of human life from conception to natural death? because of the political partners and relationships I have? Or on the other side of the political aisle, do my political attachments uh, lead me to undervalue the importance of caring for the poor or caring for migrants? These are some of the the, the questions that we sort of propose in the document that I think are are important. one of the, the the major problems and challenges that, that we sort of saw in our current political environment is how uh, how how easy it is to be dismissive of others of those who would vote for other parties who would vote for other candidates. You know, I can't count the number of times that I hear people say anybody who votes for candidate X must be crazy. They must be stupid. I don't know how I could even have a conversation with them, right? The, the level of dismissal can be very high uh, in our society. And I think one of the, the most important invitations for me in this document is to, to really try to detach ourselves a bit more from our own views and preconceptions and instead move towards ways that we can engage authentically uh, with those who may have very strong political convictions that are different uh, from my own. Not, not to rush towards immediately engaging them in debate, not to kind of start out with the assumption that I'm definitely right about this and they're definitely wrong, uh, but to really you know, start with some openness, to try to understand the, the roots of their convictions, uh, to be open to the possibility that, that I might have something uh, to learn from them. And, and so I think here the, the, the posture that we're proposing uh, is, is one of, of humility, you know, one of listening, 
Uh, and and one reason why I think that this is an, an important contribution in in our uh, in our political environment is is that this is uh, pretty radically different from the posture that we would see in most political discourse in in most political coverage uh, at this time. Uh, I, I think that that engaging in others from this starting point that I. I know that I don't have all the answers, and and maybe this other person can shed some light uh, on, on on some of those answers for me. So these are a, a couple of of the encounters, the, the 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 forms of encounter. I think are are important that we're proposing here: encounter with God, encounter with others, encounter with those who disagree with me. Another type of encounter that we propose as important is encounter with those on the margins of society, encounter, personal encounter with those who are most vulnerable, those who are most impacted, most affected by political decisions. Uh, of course, solidarity with the poor, with the suffering, with the excluded is, is a key principle of Catholic social teaching. And it's only through those personal encounters, those personal friendships that, that we ourselves can be formed and transformed, that, that we can internalize uh, their hopes and struggles. And, and our, our hope, I think part of the gospel teaching, is that our own political engagement uh, should flow from those, those real relationships with, with people uh, more so than from uh, abstract ideologies that, that we may have on certain issues. And finally, and, and just briefly, uh, a final form of encounter, that encounter with, with creation, uh, right? That in, in order to be better stewards uh, of our common home, uh, it is so important that, that we ourselves have a personal a, a, a connection with our environment uh, and, and that this connection is not something different from our encounter with other people. Pope Francis is great at always emphasizing uh, integral ecology, that the social issues are are, um, are are fundamentally bound up with uh, these environmental and social issues are, are fundamentally bound together, uh, so that all of these forms are, of encounter are crucial. So these were some of our main uh, considerations in drafting this document, and and so just a few notes uh, to kind of to close. Um, importantly, that I'm really happy to be kind of discussing it in this uh, particular forum. Um, as you can see, you know, both from the, the, the document's introduction, from its table of contents, from the questions we put throughout it, it wasn't drafted kind of primarily to be read uh, alone by individuals, but to be discussed by, by groups, right? Or, or, you know, more so than the, to be discussed, but really to be, be kind of a spur uh, to these types of discussions. We, we included these, these questions in, in hope that they may prompt a deeper level of sharing uh, among folks, ideally folks who are coming from different places uh, politically. Um, our, our, our hope is that in these groups, as I said, we may listen to one another, learn from one another, expand our own uh, kind of horizons, our own uh, thinking about political issues. Um, the purpose isn't that, that we abandon our own political uh, commitments or, or even water them down, but, but really uh, through sharing them with others, especially those coming from a different place than ourselves, uh, that we may examine them more closely, uh, that we may, may listen to others and, and learn from, from them uh, in an environment of, of respectful listening, right? And I think that's exactly what, what the forum uh, through this process is promoting uh, an environment of respectful listening where even very sensitive issues like political issues uh, can be be shared uh, at a deep level in, in knowing that, you know, the, what we share is going to be listened to, respected, heard by those in the circle uh, with us uh, in a way that that is not meant primarily to persuade others that, that we're right and they're wrong, but, but really as a way to uh, get to know one another and ourselves uh, better. 
Uh, and so with with all of that in mind, I, I, I hope that we've kind of helped along with with your own reading of the document to set the groundwork for some uh, productive and fruitful conversations uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Ted. That was great, uh, right on time as well, which is always appreciated. But thank you for your uh, wonderful expansion of this um, of our discerning document and um, the kinds of kind of breaking open the kinds of conversations we we need to be having uh, in this time. Um, and Ted really spoke about kind of a nice way to to move in um, to our next portion of the evening. But before I get into that, I just want to, uh, Ted has another commitment, so he won't be um, with us for the remainder of the evening, but just um, uh, before you go, uh, again, thank you very much, Ted. Uh, uh, wonderful input uh, and breaking open um, our continuing conversation. Um, so we will be moving into small groups, um, which is all being worked out. Um, behind the scenes uh, technically, and I think we're all pretty familiar with uh, small group sharing, but I'll just say a few words uh, about that, and then I'm gonna ask, uh, invite uh, Tora from the Center of Oblat to lead us in um, uh, a listening disposition um, exercise to move us into uh, small groups. But just a word about small groups and the kind of the process uh, we'll be in groups of about uh, seven, six, seven people, uh, and there will, uh, yeah, and there will be a facilitator for each one. And the idea is that we can prayerfully share with one another how this discerning document, contemplation and political action, um, has resonated with us according to um, um, a set, um, uh, according to three reflection questions. As you know, that there's there's a number of questions throughout the document itself, and we couldn't um, attend to all those questions. So we created supplementary questions that kind of get at, um, you know, those questions within the guide itself. Uh, and I'm going to, I'll read out uh, briefly those questions for us. Um, we're going to be reflecting on, first of all, what struck me most from this document? Our second kind of set of questions, what election issues will likely determine my vote? So we're getting into the specifics here. What do I find influences my vote in terms of social media, podcast, television? Like, where do we get our information and how does this influence uh, our votes? And what do I feel should not influence my vote? Sure. And then our third sort of set of questions, third round of questions, I guess you could say, is how can I be more prayerfully discerning during times of election? And what prayers or faith-rooted practices could help me to see God at work in the political process? So those will be our three kind of sets of questions, and the facilitator will, will walk us through them uh, in our small groups. Um, so it's just a few words about the um, small group sharing process. It, the expectation is that, is that we're sharing prayerfully not just we're not just speaking out of our faith, but we're sharing out of our faith in Christ, but we're sharing out of our prayer, our active faith. We're sharing out of our relationship with God through Christ uh, in our world today. And it's in a, a circle format. So we are online, so we're not an actual physical circle, but uh, digitally we are. And so the Facilitator, uh, to start us off, will set a speaking order and we'll have about two to three minutes for each of us to share in a circle style method. Uh, we'll have about 20 minutes uh, for each uh, question. 
And it's not a time to respond to what others have said in your circle. It's, it's not a back and forth. It's a circle. And you're sharing what you have, what you have reflected upon prior to this gathering. It's in a peripheral way. It's not responding to what you heard, but how you have responded to the document itself according to the set question. So we do encourage everyone to focus on the question that is set aside for each round, not just, you know, um, how you're feeling today, but on the question itself. Um, and the facilitator will, will guide you through. And if you're, if facilitator senses you're, you're, you're coming to the end of your time, he or she will put up her, his or her hand as a, kind of a 30 second warning. Um, and it, it is a, a time of prayerful sharing and listening. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a space of confidentiality, really encouraging us that uh, it's a, we're, we're striving to create a trusting environment with one another in which we can be honest and transparent on very sensitive topics. As we all know, politics, <laughs> so often we want to stay away from political conversation because it's just so, um, it could be so triggering. Um, but we do want to encourage a prayerful, trusting, confidential environment in which we can be transparent with the questions that we are asked uh, to reflect upon. Um, if we have time, it's up to you know the, your each group's um, discretion. You know, having a second round of you know like beyond the questions itself. It's a time to respond how you have been moved, to share how you have been moved by what you have heard uh, in your circle, in your sharing. Um, but that will depend on time, and that could be popcorn style, but, um, you know. So, but you can work that out with your facilitator, depending on time. And so I think... Um, that's all that needs to be said about uh, sharing circles. I think most of you are familiar with them anyway, so hopefully it's just a reminder. Um, so without um, further ado, I will invite Tara to move us into uh, a listening circle, um, like a listening disposition exercise to move us into small groups. Thank you. Um... I'm just trying to share my. Um, yep, we see it. One of the things that we thought to share with you um, is the levels of listening, and it comes from uh, Otto Scharmer at the Presencing Institute and and from Theory U. So I know that a number of congreg congregations are uh, know about this, but um, for some of you, it might be new. Um, so Otto Scharmer identifies four levels of listening. Um, the first level uh, is just downloading, um, you know, our own habits of judgment, um, reconfirming or rejecting um, new ideas. Uh, and it's just sort of out of habit. And the second level is uh, factual listening. So um, noticing the differences or where, um, and this is at the level of sort of having an open mind to new ideas, um, confirming um under things that we understood or uh, disconfirming. The third level is empathic listening, um, is listening more with an open heart. We're pretty familiar with this, sort of seeing the world from, through someone else's eyes. Um, you know, that sort of relationship, rational listening, um, uh, hearing that other person. The fourth level is uh, sort of more at the level of discernment, um, and it's it's he labels it generative listening, or listening to uh, listening from the source, which he uses secular language to sort of come at. You know, we can think of it as a spirit, or you know, a discernment um, towards, and what he calls an emerging future, um, something wanting to emerge, um, connecting with what's really going on in reality right now. And so we can think of this kind of as a prophetic listening, uh, prophetic communal listening uh, as an exercise. 
Um, so I just have a brief sort of grounding exercise uh, that um, I will invite you to, if you like, uh, to turn off your camera because I will invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. Um, so just trying to put us into a space uh, where we can quiet the, the things going on in our mind, things coming up and things that we've been involved in today. Uh, so I invite you to start by placing your feet on the floor and sitting in a comfortable position with your back supported by the chair or couch. Um, and just to take a cleansing breath um, in and even sort of slightly sighing on the out breath, if that feels right for you. I invite you to take a second breath in and exhale. And if you'd like to close your eyes, uh, you may, or you can gaze softly at a particular point in front of you, allowing your lids to lower uh, just a bit. We'll take another deep breath in and exhaling longer than you inhale this time. And we'll continue this pattern of breath, inhaling and exhaling a little bit longer, calming our system. Feeling the weight of gravity in our feet and on the chair that supports us, sort of sinking into that. And on the inhale, uh, feeling your belly, feeling that rise. And feeling your belly lower on the exhale, just a little bit longer. So now bringing awareness to the feeling of the cooler air entering our nose. And exhaling a little um, warmer on the exhale than the inhale. And then just returning to our normal pattern of breath with this new newfound awareness. Coming back to the feeling of weight in our chair, the gravity of feet of our feet on the floor. And in your own time, just opening your eyes and turning on the camera. Um, so my name is Leah Watkins. Thanks everyone for being here this evening. I am the uh, director of the Ministry for Social Justice, Peace and Creation Care with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto, who was one of the uh, co-organizers for this evening. Um, our ministry is um, invites and prepares all people to answer the prophetic call of the gospel to help heal our wounded earth through oneness with God, creation and neighbor. And we work to address root causes of injustice and oppression through informed civic engagement. And I have been asked this evening uh, to facilitate uh, some feedback time. So we would love to hear from folks if there are um, key insights or stories that you would like to share uh, from your um, your listening circle. Do keep in mind that this is being recorded. So um, I would ask that if you're sharing, maybe don't name specific people because what we had shared was uh, confidential, but you can talk more generally. Um, so you can raise your hand virtually, physically. I will try to let me change my view here so I can see everyone's camera uh, who's on camera. Anyone have a key highlight or insight or maybe a, a theme or pattern that emerged in your conversations? Janice. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that emerged in our session was the importance of uh, prayer. We all talked about how important it we all talk about the place of prayer in our lives as Catholic Christians or Christian Catholics. I don't know which way it should go. And for me, because I'm a person with permanent disabilities, I live on prayer and I just always figured I was just the weirdo. But it's nice to know <laughs> there are weirdos out there. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think most of us would identify in part of, as part of that club today. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. But I, would anybody else like to share? Maybe if I could just echo that, I was in the same group and um, as Janice. And, you know, I had mentioned, um, I don't know if everyone agrees, but we see, you know, we're, we live in a highly um, polarized time, of course, as we know, highly politicized time. Seems things seem to be more politicalized. And so many people speak out of their faith that speak out of their belief. But, uh, you know, I wonder how prayerful they are, though we speak out of our faith and belief. But is it through prayer, through prayer, through actual relationship with God, through Christ and, and other people? And and prayer is not just liturgical prayer or in words, but um, how prayerfully engaged are we with uh, the um, people who are in need, the lonely, the marginalized, you know, uh, who are in need of companionship and, and help. So prayer in those many guises, not just verbal and interior, but uh, actively, you know. Um, yeah. Thanks, Trevor. I really like just um, feeling the level of care that everyone has, you know, when sharing. I mean, maybe some people are more positive, some are not as positive and so on, but you can feel that everyone is caring. And I think it's it's a very good sign. It's uh, it's it's consoling to see that uh, it, it matters, you know, uh, the political discussions, the political discernment, the prayer around it, the the actions. So it it matters, and everyone cares for 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 these uh, these things, and and that's a very good sign, I find. Thanks for sharing. I'd invite everyone maybe uh, to wrap up this discussion. Maybe you can uh, click on your React button, but maybe choose a choose a reaction that reflects how you're feeling right now. We'll see what pops up. Great. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much for sharing. I'll uh, pass things over now back to Matthew. Thanks, Clay. It's good to see you again. Um, and uh, it's good to see a couple people there, like just hi, um, Agnes, and some other folks I need to catch up with. So anyway, um, Catholic Conscience is really just deeply honored to be a part of this tonight. Um, and I've learned a lot, but it, it actually it all fits together very well because I, I started Catholic Conscience some years ago, um, actually with all candidate meetings and parishes. And actually interacting with people, and we, we we provoked a lot of actually very positive encounters, just because we were trying to engage people in the full range of gospel and social teaching, um, and respectfully listening to one another and trying to build from our differences. And it was actually very encouraging the way people responded. Um, and but one of the questions that came up most often, of course, was, you know, well, geez, none of these parties has really got a solid Catholic ticket. Who do I vote for? And so out of that, I talked to a lot of people. And actually, I ended up with St. Ignatius's um, Discernment of Spirits, you know, which I was telling our group that I, I like a lot because uh that kind of spiritual discernment is really what we should be, how the way we should be making all our life decisions and civic engagement is one of the most important, but it's just another part of it. So um, that's a big part of what we've done. Our The goal of Catholic conscience is to kind of try to bring gospel values into civic discourse because, you know, we have lost the common moral thread. My own personal fear is that 
different voices, not really in a massive conspiracy, but different voices are just found that it's profitable to, to draw in one other aspect to pull us apart, make us see each other as different and hateful and fearful. And, you know, and so what we, what we kind of evolved into partly because of the way the parties were behaving and partly because of the pandemic is we moved a lot of stuff online. I'm hoping to go back to the all candidate meetings, but um, we started um, actually just taking the entire published platforms of each of the parties and um, carving them up, literally cutting and pasting and putting them next to um, side by side next to Catholic social teaching from the compendium and from the gospels and from the later encyclicals. Um, and it's been pretty popular and it's kind of grown. And I'm, I'm going to show you because one of the things that's coming out of this is I was kind of in a process already or Catholic conscious was a process already of kind of trying to provide Catholics with a, a good starting point for their discernment process. So there's materials about prayer and spiritual discernment. And of course, you know, we end with our um, platform comparisons. Um, but I've tried to pull it together on one page. and um, this process has really made me think a lot, like um, the document that um, Father introduced at the beginning, Father Ted introduced, is obviously a beautiful, beautiful document that really goes into the discernment part. Um, but there's other things, too. And so we've kind of evolved to where we've got kind of three basic steps. I, I, I think they said it was okay if I share my screen. I'll, I'll show you the page and just kind of go through it quickly. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that people want to. Um, but, um, it's, it's evolved quite a lot. Like you, if you go back to the earliest ones, you will never, <laughs> you might not even recognize it because they, they, they evolved every time, but this is the, the homepage for, um, the next Can Canadian federal election. And we, part of what we were talking, you know, in our group about how during the Cardinals dinner, everybody was looking at their cell phones, wondering how the U S election was coming along. And I was watching a little bit um google analytics to watch the website and i i want to say that it was beautiful to watch because the response to the u.s page was the biggest response catholic conscience it had to date um but about five o'clock on election night the americans really tapered off and canada came back in the biggest surge i've ever seen and now more than 20,000 people have worked with this page already and the election hasn't even been called yet so it's kind of evolved into i think a resource for people for the longer the deeper kind of discernment to think about the issues and um think about what the the parties are saying but also i think they like the discernment pieces because actually okay so you start here you got a little note here i'm because I'm still working on it, I said, please pardon our mass, and we've got the note about tonight. But this is kind of the, the start of it, and you see that we talk about getting started here. You know how to vote like a Catholic. You jump on this page, and there's a, a much more simplified and actually a bit more, sorry there, Sonal, a bit more by-the-numbers thing about how to approach this. You know, you, you pray, you inform yourself, and then it, you go out and vote, and hopefully you stay engaged. And then we've got materials that have been developing for parishes and groups about engagement and actually some prayers. Like, for example, I'm, I'm hoping to promote an online rosary before the next election. So if people will please consider joining that, that'd be, a, I think, a lovely thing. But there's also some rosary reflections on there that kind of, you know, talk about, well, the, for example, the Annunciation is probably the greatest single act of um, subsidiarity in history, right? The creator of the universe turned to a, a small young woman and said, hey, I want to ask you to help bring the Savior and talk about using your gas, right? And then, of course, we got the platform. So we provide here, like I said, I, I, we're aiming kind of almost for, you know, just a good starting place for whatever you need and then refer you to it um, if, if you got other questions to, to sources for it. So we've got and we, we try to provide the key documents, both in downloadable form. Like we've got a document here that I think Stan is going to share with everybody here tonight. It started as a two-pager for um, distribution in parish bulletins. And I got to say, that is the single most popular download on the website, the various versions. And I'm really, really pleased with that. People are taking it very seriously. If Let me take it just a minute and just show you really quickly in a minute. We, we've added this document. And then we've got both browsable versions of the complete comparisons and also downloadable ones, which are popular. And I've just started adding links. We've been around long enough that we've got 
some prior elections and related elections. And I'm actually finding that those are very popular amongst people who are really trying to figure out what's going on. And I, I know that a lot of civics classes, for example, use these materials and some other stuff that we write for our newsletter. But if you go, we've, you know, got seven themes, you know, and they're not quite the same as everybody else's because they kind of evolved out of all of the issues that are presented in the party platform. So I've got the sanctity of life, of course, and we've just got, you know, kind of a summary of various parts of the church teaching to start with, you know, like abortion, euthanasia, one of the commandments is you shall not kill. That's a good starting point. Um, and then we just, like I said, I just cut and paste the, basically the entire platform of each party and just say, here's what they said. I, the only thing I cut out is I cut out all the vituperations against the other parties. You know, I, it's just not helpful. We're trying to promote a, 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 a positive discussion. Some of the parties' platforms get pretty short once you do that, though, which makes my job easier. Anyway, you scroll all the way through and you got, you know, rights and responsibility and then good government. And thanks to people out in Saskatchewan, we actually added a bunch of points to ponder. I wanted to kind of show you because the environment one is kind of cool. I And, and people like Agnes have been helping with this. Um, because I'm an engineer and a lawyer, but I'm not an engineer or expert in hardly anything. So I've been starting to turn to things like um, government documents, uh, like from the government, the, the budget. Here's a an aggregate and historical future of greenhouse gas emissions that was published by the government. And I'm trying to point out to people that if you look at these things, the, the part of the curve in the past always remains flat. But then suddenly, magically, in the future, it starts going down. <laughs> and people like it cop and things like that get very upset. So anyway, I'm always open to suggestions because we're trying to make this very useful to people. Um, so maybe I'll just flip over, if it's okay, to the um, the, the other document. This is the um, attachment. Hopefully, this is showing up now. Did it just change to the doc? Okay. So this is kind of the very bare bones um process that we are, have evolved, you know, registering, praying, looking, learning, listening, and chatting, just like we just did tonight, uh, choosing confidently with prayer, um, God will lead us to the vote that God wants. And we really try to stress that, you know, we're praying for the vote that is pleasing to God, regardless that God wants from us, regardless of what he wants from somebody else, you know, that's kind of their business. Um, and then the, the, so the original second page is kind of a summary of the uh, the seven themes, the way we've carved it up, at least for the time being. And then the permanent principles and fundamental values of Catholic social teaching. And then, thanks to Sabrina, we have added a page here of external resources that um, may invite some more reflection. And I'm hoping to build on that both on the website and here. And Sab Agnes has her hand up. So, yeah, please. So Matthew, this looks wonderful, and I'll definitely be sharing a link to to this site. Um, I have a question for you, and it's kind of a big one. We um, from um, MLS in Canada have been asked to be more intentional about our place in Canada as a bilingual country. Um, I know that um, civil society in Quebec has... <laughs> A very strong component, but is there any possibility that some of your website might be available in French? Oh, actually, um, thank you for asking because we've made a lot of progress. Um, now, I, I'm still working with Dominic about, you know, whether we just do a, a parallel French page, but if you look up here, there's actually the Google machine translations to different languages, which I think work pretty well. But even more importantly, I've started... Um, translate like if you see here this document that i just showed you there's a french version and you know what i have to say the translations are good enough that um in the we just i just got through with seven elections right <laughs> and i'm pleased to say that the french downloads of the french language documents are 40 to 50 percent of um the entire total so the french people are really coming to this in a big way it's just so reassuring. it's it, it feels good when you put this much work into something and it starts working you know because <laughs> I am very concerned to keep the whole country together. Yeah, so thank you for asking that. Um, but yeah, that translations a key part. And actually, everybody raise your hand. I've asked Stan if we can maybe work on a, a French language translation of the big red guide here. Thank you. So um, if there's no more questions, that's kind of what I had to say or comments. Okay, well, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I'm sure people will be 
uh, exploring that uh, your site in more detail if they haven't already heard heard about it. And we thought this was important to share as a one more immediate step in going forward, Bill, at our conversation tonight. But even looking um, forward longer term, we uh, we plan that this is the beginning of a series. That this is just our evening together is more is kind of be, consider a dispositional exercise, disposing ourselves towards um, this kind of needed conversation. And that going forward, uh, in partnership with with all of our partners tonight, um, we can plan um, further gatherings that are more specific around issues, uh, whether uh, that would be part of uh, provincial elections, uh, the federal election, which we know is coming up within the year. Um, so that's something that we are planning. Um, and we're not reinventing the wheel, that there's a lot of organizations that have done um, really uh, excellent work on uh, helping form our consciences and our awareness of the issues um, that we face as a, as a, as a community. Um, and so not just Catholic Conscience being one of them, of course, and uh, uh, Catholic Charities of Toronto uh, has, uh, Toronto Diocese has worked in this area. So, um, so stay tuned for um, uh, further conversations that will be more specific on on specific elections. And Catholic Charities, Matthew, you know, representing uh, our Catholic community, but we also hope to open it up to um, um, more ecumenical uh, perspectives as well, um, uh, other Christian denominations, um, and even if. Um, um, interfaith uh, conversations as well. So not just limited to the Catholic Church. And so so we just, we're going to conclude now. Um, and we just want to thank everyone for for your participation, um, for availing yourself to this kind of a conversation. Um, thank you to all of our partners. And stay tuned for um, further um, further engagement.